All right, so <clears throat> I want to start out. An introduction to general endocrinology. Okay, so endocrinology it is a subset of physiology. Physiology is going to be the study of function, and so we're applying the study and principle of function uh, physiology specifically to endocrine system. And the endocrine system is the system of glands that produce hormones, and so we're going to study really these chemical messengers that are called or known as hormones. And a hormone is going to be any molecule that is made and secreted by cells and glands that enter into the circulation and target a disease. So sometimes there are molecules that are made and they get secreted, but then they have an effect on a neighboring cell or a cell that's really close by or even on uh, its own cell. Hormones. H O R M. So they're made uh, in then they target a disease. So, as I was saying, that uh, we have molecules that are produced, they get released, and they'll have a, a nearby effect. So, if we affect a cell um, that is the cell that produced the molecule, that's called autocrine, and it's not an endocrine mechanism. If we go a short distance, such as in neurotransmission, that's a special form of paracrine signaling. So, endocrine has to have that point. We have to deposit the chemical into the bloodstream and let it circulate to, the, to a, a distant target. And so these are going to be made and secreted by a group of cells and glands that properly are going to comprise the endocrine system. Ultimately, as these molecules circulate through the organism uh, and they interact with uh, other cells and cause changes in the physiology of those cells, we're going to have those changes that are associated with regulation and growth of organs and other types of cells. Endocrine hormones will be regulatory molecules and will help to uh, induce growth. And as you sort of look at these processes here, um, what you're going to begin to think about is well, there's another system that regulates as well. And that's going to be the nervous system. We'll do a compare and contrast here in just a minute. Uh, but one of the things that stands out here is its longer term physiological uh, phenomenon, that growth. Growth doesn't happen over a short amount of time. It happens over a long period of time, weeks and months and years. So if the endocrine system is comprised of these glands and cells, it's probably uh, beneficial to begin to take a look at these um, at, at the glands. And the picture that I have up here is a comparison between uh, what's known as an endocrine gland, shown here on the right, and then an exocrine gland that's shown on the left. Both of them produce substances. The endocrine gland is going to have a capillary network, whereas the exocrine gland is going to have a capillary network. And it's actually going to be the duct that the exocrine substance is released into. And it's the capillaries that just supply the metal of the particular cells. So when we talk about an endocrine gland, it is referred to as a ductless gland. Right? 
Okay, so no duct system. That means we have to deposit our hormones into the bloodstream. And so these are some pretty vascular tissues. Higher ratio of cells to uh, capillary surface area. As opposed to the exocrine glands, which are ducted, so they do have this tubular system. And usually the cells that surround the tubes, the duct, they produce a substance, and that substance is released through the duct. Uh, and so then from there, that substance will empty, in some cases, to the outside, such as uh, with sweat glands, or into the lumen of an organ. Uh, for example, the pancreatic duct, uh, acinar tissue of the pancreas is, is actually an exocrine tissue. And so it produces a substance that we know that, that we refer to as pancreatic juice. It contains peptide, form, uh, peptide um, uh, molecules or molecules that break up peptides rather uh, and release that into, into the small intestine for digestive processes. Now, as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, the endocrine system is a, is a regulatory system. And we have another regulatory system in physiology in mammals, and that's the nervous system. And it seems like that this would be redundant, but actually there's some, there's some differences. Okay? But there is also some overlap, and so I want to just real quick go through some of these differences and some of this overlap. And so what you're looking at here uh, in this figure is you have... Um, the, the true endocrine system, and then you have a true nervous system, and then there's kind of this intermediate system that's between endocrine and nervous, where you basically have nervous tissue that interacts in a endocrine fashion. So we're going to call that the neuroendocrine. So when we look at endocrinology, And the nervous system, these really are both intercellular communication systems. Intracellular communication systems. In other words, we have a sender, some tissue or cell type that produces a signal, in this case it's a chemical signal, and delivers that to a target. So that signal, signal from the sender to the target, it actually has to go through, in the case of the endocrine system, the extracellular environment that includes the blood, and through, and for the nervous system, through the extracellular environment, which would include the synapse, and also the gap. Uh, one nervous uh, molecule, neuron, I should say, to another nerve or a neuron to another type of tissue. So they're both going to have this kind of configuration where they go from a sender to a target, but there's also some differences as well. So the nervous system, it uses not hormones, but a class of molecules known as neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are going to be molecules that will attach to or bind to a specific receptor. And those specific receptors are going to be in the target membrane, which will be after or post the synapse. And so again, this is more like a paracrine. Neurotransmission that's specifically for the paraffin like activity of the nervous system. Now, if we take a look at the endocrine system, again, so we'll have that sender target configuration. Rather than using neurotransmitters, we're now using hormones. 
hormones are produced from our ductless glands. And our target is also going to have in the membrane or somewhere in the cell incorporated receptors that can be bound by the hormone. Now, a lot of times, individual hormones will be able to bind to multiple types of receptors. And even though neurotransmitters can do something very similar, they actually have less diversity. So, for example, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine binds to cholinergic receptors. We have two subtypes of cholinergic receptors, muscarinic and the nicotinic receptors, whereas um, the molecule testosterone, which is one of our steroid hormones, it can bind the androgen receptor, it can bind the AKT, it can bind other molecules that have some unique physiological and molecular chemical um, diversity. The other big difference here, and I've already mentioned this, but just to hit on it again, the, the other big difference in the communication system here is the bloodstream. When the bloodstream becomes this global network for the endocrine system, and so what that means is when you release a hormone, right, well actually let's say this, when you release a neurotransmitter, you go across the specific synapse, and there's really only one location that a neurotransmitter released from a specific neuron can go. It goes to the postsynaptic cell. Whereas in the endocrine system, I release it into the bloodstream, and I may be looking to regulate, um, I don't know, blood pressure. And so I have a series of hormones that help regulate blood pressure, but they also change uh, other characteristics, other physiological functions in other cells. And so it's not a real specific response. It's a global response. The response in an individual tissue is specific, but you're going to have effects that are kind of secondary to the main effect for that specific hormone that you're using and your endocrine system hormones. Now, just like you see here in the middle of this picture, you have kind of this crossover where you have a group of neurons that have an endocrine nature. And these cells are typically referred to as neuroendocrine cells. And what these neuroendocrine cells do is they secrete in a neurotransmitter fashion that don't just target a specific postsynaptic cell. And we're actually going to look at uh, one place in particular where we see this. This is from uh, the interaction that we have with the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary. We have two hormones that are produced there, oxytocin and arginine vasopressin, uh, also known as antidiuretic hormone. They are released from neurons which is like neurotransmission, but they enter the bloodstream, which is like the endocrinology. So the neurotransmitters circulate. And so we classify these special. These are neuroendocrine cells. They undergo neurosecretion. And then these are frequently referred to as neurohormones. And we have kind of this nerve to blood interaction that occurs. So you got the nervous system that undergoes neurotransmission, you got the endocrine system that goes undergoes endocrine release of a hormone. And then you have this uh, set of cells or neurons that, that have endocrine uh, endocrine function, which we're going to refer to as the neuroendocrine cells. So that's a basic kind of in a nutshell look at endocrine. Uh, we'll take a look at um, endocrine glands, uh, their anatomy, their location as we start to dive into individual hormones. Um, but what I want to do now is I want to talk through uh, some of the history 
of uh, energy and all that. Because it's actually a relatively new science. Uh, when you look at the history of science, we've been doing science for a long time. And endocrinology um, really began to, to take fold and take fashion back in the 1800s, uh, which within the scientific <laughs> landscape or timescape is a relatively new discipline. Uh, and one of the first experiments that was ever done was done by a scientist. His name was Berkel. Uh, Arnold Adolf Berkel, he was a uh, a German scientist, and his paper was originally written in German, and it has been since translated into other languages. So here's a picture of Arnold Adolf Berkel. It's possible that he's related to Ariel Kerbels. But he designed an experiment where he was looking at roosters, male roosters, or what are known as cockroaches. And so this experiment that he designed is he would remove the testes or leave the testes present and would allow development to occur. Okay? So he had basically in an initial experiment Young roosters that had no surgery and they developed. And then he had some roosters that he removed both testes and then they would develop. So they all started out as young roosters, which you can see here at the top, had surgery or no surgery. And then he looked at the developmental characteristics. And what he found is when testes were present, when they were left undisrupted, as normal as a rooster could be, you have a normal rooster. And in particular, what he was really looking at is he was looking at this structure on the top of the head, which is known as the cone. And then you have this structure here on the bottom, which was known as the waddle. So he's looking at some anatomical parameters. But then he also looked at um, some behaviors as well. And so the combs and the waddles were normal in a normal rooster. They had an interest in hens, right? They were sexually attracted to hens. They have a normal crow, a robust, uh, a robust call. And then bird society, especially roosters, is, is bizarre. If I take 30 roosters, put them in all in the same cage, you're going to have one rooster that pecks all the others. And then you're going to have a second rooster that pecks all of them except for that one that pecked all of them. And so you have this really defined order. And there's a lot of fighting and a lot of aggression. And so the, the normal rooster here would have just what would be classified as a normal aggressive fight behavior, okay? When we had the testes removed, we had both anatomical and behavioral changes that occurred. Okay, so you can see that we had less developed, or what I'm going to refer to as smaller waddles and combs. So those anatomical features, they didn't develop the same way. There was less attraction to hens. So a lack of interest in hens. And then these were usually the lowest on the pecking order. They were not aggressive. Okay. So from there, he did a second study, which is outlined here on the bottom. And, and basically, what happened in this study is we did this, uh, this remove or place type study. Uh, and this was done in a single bird. Okay? So that's what you see happening here. You would remove one of the testes, and you would replace it in the abdominal cavity. And actually, really what you would do is you remove both of them and replace one of them into the abdominal cavity. And so what that would do is it would allow that uh, implanted 
testes from the same bird, from a single bird, to revascularize. And it would continue to work as uh, a test. And so the observations that were made here is we developed a normal root. Now, the other thing that was noticed when those birds were uh, killed at the, at the end of the study, they also went and observed the, um, the testing that had been replaced into the abdominal cavity. And what they found, and that's what's shown here, is that testing actually grew in size. And this is a um, phenomenon that's known as compensatory hypertrophy. Compensatory basically means it compensated for the loss of both of those testes. It's grown in size, which is the hypertrophy. It's grown in size, and so we have, um, at the time, if you didn't know this, testosterone not even been discovered. I would go on a call and you know, oh yeah, testosterone on those issues too. Good. We would have had probably very close to normal testosterone levels with this single uh, compensated test. Over here on this side, what was done is we had a procedure where we took and removed the testes, and then we would switch and replace. And so you have two, two or more birds, right? You have two birds, kind of partner birds here, remove testes from both, switch them, replace a single testy from one bird into the other bird's abdominal cavity. And when they did this, as you can see in this figure, we end up with a normal rooster. And the testes, again, underdog, have underdog compensatory hypertrophy. And the conclusion that was made here by Berthold is that there is a substance that's produced in the testes that is. Uh, responsible for all of the different effects that we see. The growth in the color of the waddle and the girl's behavioral characteristics as well. Now, at that time, we just identified that there was some sort of substance, but we didn't know what that substance was. of the study are concluding that there's a substance of effect, but again, it's unknown. Okay? Now, you all are going to understand that we're, we're eventually going to put testosterone tables having these effects, uh, but it's years before that substance is actually able to be discovered and synthesized. So that started this area of endocrinology. We had gland cells that were producing substances. Substances have very real physiological, behavioral, and anatomical effects. The, the next major event in the area of endocrinology uh, it involved two individuals, Yellow and Burson. And what's pretty interesting about this is Yellow is actually, you know, it's Yasmin Yellow. So you had this partnership between male and female. One of uh, one of the women who uh, early on broke some of the some of the barriers in science, um, and and they developed a technique that actually has become the basis for a lot of what is done in endocrine research today. They developed a technique that's known as radio immunoassay. So a radio immunoassay. And basically the way that this works is they were using part of the immune system, which were antibodies, to conjugate or to connect to molecules of interest. And then they were able to capture those molecules of interest and look at the amount of radiation coming off of tracer molecules. And there was this relationship 
that allow them to basically begin to quantify those substances, okay? So up here at the very top, uh, you basically, you have these molecules that um, have been uh, conjugated to radioactive um, particles. That's called an antigen. Antigens bind to antibodies. Antigen on top, antibody down here, okay? So they basically put in these radioactive antigens with these red dots representing the radioactive antigen. And then they're interested in this blue molecule. So this could be testosterone, it could be insulin, it could be glucagon, it could be orexin, whatever, whatever we're interested in, the protein or the hormone that we're interested in. And we mix the unlabeled um, molecule or antigen, doesn't have the, the radioactive, we put that in and mix that in with both radioactive antigens and then unlabeled antigens. And those begin to bind our molecule of interest and the radioactive particle. So we have this competition that begins to occur. And as that happens, you begin to have this interaction where you have, um, depending on the concentration of our molecule of interest, more or less of those molecules of interest binding onto that antigen, binding to the antibody, and then we can check, check for radio, uh, radioactivity. So you look for the amount of radioactivity. The more radioactivity means that there's more of this radioactive antigen, which means that there's less of our molecule of interest. And then vice versa, the less radioactivity means more of our molecule of interest. And so this is a way that we can actually begin to quantify concentrations of these substances that we're interested in. It's going to become the basis for other techniques. Uh, one of the big ones is called uh, the ELISA or the EIA. ELISA or EIA are the same type of technique. It's known as the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And rather than using radioactivity, we use uh, chemical reactions. And so if we replace the radioactive isotope with a molecule that then we can add an enzyme in and we can split it and make it on light or some other product that then we can detect. So up until that point, and what we saw there was Burkhold is using Burkhold is using what's known as a bioassay. Okay? And there's a lot of different um, examples in history of bioassays being used. Uh, another example of a bioassay is they took two dogs and they connected their, uh, their vasculature uh, together, connected vessels together, and they would do one thing in, in one animal and they'd watch the response in the other animal. And so they could try to extract calcium, and they would extract calcium from one and would see calcium extracted in the other. Or the roosters switching the testes or putting the testes back in into a different location and just looking and observing to what happens. It's known as a bioassay. Bioassays are not quantified in the observation. With the radio amino assay, we now have this ability where we can begin to quantify some of the things that we're noticing. We can begin to quantify um, the, the molecules. So with a bioassay, I may be interested in a molecule, and to see if that molecule is present, maybe I pull a blood sample from one animal and put it into another animal and see if I get a, that behavioral change. The more behavioral change, the more general concentration of the molecule I have. Does that make sense? Versus if I have less in a bioassay, less change that happens in, in the uh, experimental animal, then I probably have a lower concentration. That's general. This gets us to a more specific, um, a more specific quanti quanti uh, quantitation of concentrations of molecules. And now today, for three hundred dollars, we can measure pretty specific concentrations of a number of different hormones, a number of proteins, as well as outside of the area of endocrine function. So, really, the the big thing with the development of the big take-home message with the development of the radioamino assay is now we're at this point where we're just not generalizing, 
but we actually have the ability to physiologically uh, detect. So physiological detection now becomes possible. Now, as we move into the modern era, which I would probably define the modern era as the 1950s to the present, the, uh, the areas of genetics, genomics, molecular biology are all being incorporated into endocrinology. And in particular, genetic sequencing is something that is being utilized to understand endocrine. Uh, modern era also uses what are known as knockout models. A knockout model is a way for us to turn off specific uh, proteins, made hormones that are produced. Right. So, um, if I want to knock down the amount of estrogen that is in uh, male mice, I can use um, a genetic modeling technique or a manipulation technique where I render the aromatase enzyme useless. And so I lose that chemical reaction. And then I can observe what happens in these animals. Uh, there's also knock-in models that have not been as common, but knock-in is basically putting function in to a model organism. The big thing that's happening right now that's probably pretty exciting, you probably have heard this term. There's a CRISPR-Cas9 system. Have any of you heard CRISPR-Cas before? Okay. So probably one of the places that came out most recently, um, back in 2018, earlier in the year, uh, they talked about um, a, a group in China at a Chinese uh, university had genetically engineered or genetically manipulated human embryos. And so that's a big deal in the news. Uh, they use this CRISPR-Cas system to knock out a gene that's associated with HIV death. So CRISPR-Cas is this system. It's, it's basically an immune system from um, bacteria. It's a way for bacteria to eliminate uh, foreign DNA. We actually can capitalize on that and pop in DNA molecules and take out DNA molecules from other organisms of interest. So this is real short back on there uh, on the history of endocrine chemistry. And there's a whole lot more. There's a lot of other things that we could talk about there, but I'm, I'm going to move on. So what is the point of the endocrine system? Same purpose that we have for all 11 of our organ systems in there. What is, what is the purpose of an organ system? We're going to maintain, maintain homeostasis. So homeostasis, the idea here is that we have internal environmental conditions that we need to maintain that are um, conducive or that are important for life. And so homeostasis is our ability to maintain that internal environment despite having changes uh, in our external surroundings. Right? So temperature goes down, we have the ability to maintain our body temperature. Temperature goes up, we can maintain our lower body, a uh, lower body temperature. We don't just drop temperature down, decrease temperature back up as the uh, as the environment changes. So really, humans and other organisms have this ability to resist change. We're going to define that resistance of change as metabolic demand. So we have this demand to resist change that comes from all of the chemical reactions, the metabolism of the cell of the organism. But in addition, 
we're also going to see, and we don't have this in humans, but we do have this in uh, other organisms, including some mammals, we have some form of ability to avoid adverse conditions. Okay? I mean, I guess technically you could say that you know, indoors we're going to deal with the temperature, so we can avoid the temperature outside, but we don't necessarily need to do that. Um, to a certain degree, I mean, obviously we cannot survive super cold, but we can survive a pretty wide range of, um, uh, of different temperatures. May not be comfortable, but if the temperature drops three degrees, we're going to be able to survive that. It probably won't even have to change. Okay? So, um, yeah, we can, to, to maintain internal temperature, we can resist the change through metabolism, or we can avoid the change, and so we can do things like hibernate, estivate, go into stupor, and, and there's like a bunch of right, reptiles who maybe really don't hibernate, they may actually do something else, uh, but this, the idea is that you're doing something physiologically that you're avoiding the drastic changes. Okay, so homeostasis, this idea that we have to maintain our internal environment all while being exposed to pressures from the external environment, changes in the external environment. So most commonly, we're going to run into this idea of resisting change. Okay, so resisting change. So first thing that we have to do is we have to kind of define or signify what it means by a change. So kind of an example here, uh, let's, let's focus kind of on body temperature. If my body temperature is 35 degrees centigrade, and it goes up to 35.1 degrees centigrade, is that a change? From a mathematics or arithmetic perspective, yeah, that's a change, right? 35 is not equal to 35.1. But in biology, 35 is pretty much equivalent to 35.1 if we're talking about body temperature. So what signifies a change is going to be defined really as a significant deviation from what's known as a set point. And so you're going to have the idea of the set point, which is really the average for the system, and then the deviation, which you're going to have an upper and lower limit. So for body temperature, average body temperature in humans, 37 degrees plus, minus, usually about a half a degree. So body temperature really is not considered changed if it's between 36 and a half, 37 and a half. Typically, we're right around 37 and a half. You start to move outside, you get up to 37.6, 37.7. Now you're starting to, to see a change. And so we actually have to resist that change by maintaining kind of right around that set point. Okay? And the way that that is done, you all know how this is done. We resist change by inducing what are known as feedback systems. And the feedback system is really one of the hallmarks of endocrinology. The other hallmark of understanding our endocrinology is going to be the endocrine axis. And usually these two things are combined, where you have the endocrine axis, which details the, the different hormones that are involved and how they interact. And then you have the feedback loops that tell you how those endocrine hormones are regulated. So you have an interaction and you have regulation. So with a feedback system, what we're going to begin to see as we move through each of these different endocrine hormones is we're going to be able to identify some physiological way or biological way the levels of different metabolites, the levels of different uh, 
molecules related to the chemical reactions that we have occurring inside of the cell. So I'm going to say that they can be sensed, but I'm going to put that in quotes, kind of using sense loosely here. So feedback systems, part of the process, levels of metabolites will be sensed. And then we will have our response that's going to be propagated. Okay? So this is an example of the birthing process. Okay? At some point, you are moving outside of homeostasis as you carry the baby, right? Nine months, typically 38 to 40 weeks. Uh, we're typically to a point where baby has now gotten large enough that they're going to cause some issues. Baby's got to be moved out. It's got to be moved out here into the world, okay? And so we're sensing the levels of some metabolite. In this case, we actually begin to sense uh, the levels of a hormone called oxytocin. You have the head that presses down on the cervix. This baby begins to grow, and, and as that happens, you have this nerve feedback up to uh, the hypothalamus in the brain. So what it says here, number two, is the nerve impulse from the cervix is transmitted to the brain. In response to that signal coming into the brain, we stimulate the pituitary gland to re release or secrete oxytocin. Oxytocin enters the bloodstream, and it actually goes down here and interacts with the myometrium, which is one of the layers of the uterus. In the myometrium, we have a receptor. It's called the oxytocin receptor. And it responds by causing the smooth muscle cells that are present in the uterus, in the myometrium, to undergo contraction. Okay? So oxytocin causes contraction of these smooth muscle cells. And as you squeeze down on those muscle cells, that squeezes down on baby, which pushes baby's head down on the cervix even more. And we initiate another barrage of nervous system signals back up to the brain. And the process continues. Okay? So that's an example of what's known as a positive feedback loop. It's positive because you basically have something that happens that causes that's something that happens even more pronounced the next loop around. And so it's additive. And so we're increasing the release of this substance to cause more contraction to occur, right? So the contraction is the stimulus pushing baby's head down on the cervix, causing oxytocin to be released, causing more contraction. More oxytocin, more contraction, more oxytocin, more contraction, over and over and over again until the baby is expelled from the birth canal. Now this is a, honestly a very rare occurrence within mammalian physiology. A rare occurrence. Uh, one of the other places that we run into this is within um, the, the process of blood flow. So next time I'll pick up on the other side of feedback processing, which is called the negative feedback.